Okay, so going to talk about Flux today. I'm uh, Stefan Prodan. I'm a, a Flux maintainer and I'm uh, working for WeWorks together with Tamo in the developer experience uh, team. So let's start with uh, the basics. What is Flux? Flux is a tool that helps you um, uh, build GitOps uh, pipelines across your uh, clusters for infrastructure, for apps, and so on. The, the whole idea is, is quite simple. You, uh, you define your um, cluster state in a Git repo or an S3 bucket or something like that. And you install Flux on your cluster. Then you tell Flux, hey, keep my cluster in sync with uh, whatever changes are made into the source uh, be it uh, a repo or, uh, or an S3 bucket. Who is Flux for? Uh, we have three categories of uh, users. So the first one is uh, platform engineers who build continuous delivery um, tools uh, for, for uh, developer teams. And uh, second, we have cluster operators who have to uh, maintain the cluster sheet. They have to automate the provision of clusters and all their add-ons. And finally, we have app developers uh, who rely on continuous delivery to get their um, code changes uh, shipped to production or to different uh, stages. First, I'm going to talk about uh, platform engineers. So, Flux has evolved over time. Um, the current Flux version is built on, uh, on top of a SDK that we call uh, the GitOps Toolkit. And this toolkit is made out of um, Kubernetes uh, APIs, uh, Kubernetes API extensions called custom resource definitions and um, specialized tools, uh, which are Kubernetes controllers and Flux is an opinated way of how you uh, bundle these uh, controllers and these APIs and how you make them work together. Now, you can extend the, uh, the GitOps toolkit with, with other things if, if you feel like uh, you need a, a particular feature that Flux uh, doesn't, uh, um, doesn't allow you to do. At the core of the, of the GitOps toolkit is a controller called source controller. And, and this, uh, this tool is uh, managing sources. What it does, it reaches out outside the cluster. It fetches uh, things like Git repo stories, um, Helm charts from, from, Helm, uh, from Helm repo stories, S3 buckets and so on. And it brings those manifests, those uh, definitions inside the cluster and it bundles them under a thing called artifacts. What are artifacts in Flux are um, a TARS, which contain uh, those particular manifests. Now, you can configure source controller with, uh, uh, with custom resources. For example, if you want to uh, bring a, um, a repo content inside your cluster, you'll be creating a Git repository custom resource where you specify there how source controller should do authentication, uh, maybe validation of the commits uh, authenticity using, uh, let's say, open PGP uh, code signing. Um, you can also uh, define Helm repo stories from where Helm charts will be pulled. And you can also register um, buckets being uh, uh, a cloud hosted bucket like Amazon S3 or uh, maybe your own uh, S3 compatible uh, storage like Minio. So everything else uh, that needs to interact with these sources, instead of reaching directly to them, will we'll be uh, talking to the source controller and source controller will notify any consumer if a source changes. So if let's say you do, um, you push a commit to your Git repo, Source controller monitors uh, that repo, it pulls the latest change, then it notifies uh, the other controllers in your cluster, hey, there is a change, you have to act on it. And let's see which uh, consumers uh, we have implemented. 
So the, uh, the source controller consumers are called specialized reconcilers, and they are like these tools that are, are made particular for, uh, for a single purpose. For example, if you, in your Git repositories, you uh, define customized overlays, or maybe you have plain YAMLs, then you'll be using customized controller to reconcile those manifests on the cluster. But if you want to uh, manage Helm releases, then you'll be using Helm controller. And this is the part of where you pull changes from outside and you, uh, you apply them on the cluster. But Flux also has a, a feature called uh, image automation update. And how that works is Flux through uh, the image reflector controller can monitor uh, container registries and it can detect that a new uh, image has been pushed to the registry, then uh, the image automation controller will apply changes in your Git repos based on policies. For example, you can say every time there is a stable release of Redis uh, on Docker Hub, I want to automatically upgrade my, uh, my Redis clusters. So the image automation controller will patch your YAMLs using the new version that has detected and will commit those YAMLs back to your Git repo. Then be it customized or hand controller will apply those uh, changes on the cluster. And this is how you can fully automate, uh, um, let's say patch releases, CVEs and so on, on, on your cluster without any kind of manual intervention. So if you want to extend Flux with with other things uh, like I don't know, a Terraform controller, or JSON and stuff, or maybe you want to handle pull requests and so on. Um, until we get to those, or maybe we will never get to those because they are out of out of scope. You can um, use the client SDK that we have. We have also some guides on how you can uh, create your own specialized uh, reconciler. And there is a link here, I'll, I'll be sharing these uh, slides. There is a link here to, uh, um, uh, to documentation and uh, 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 an example repo on how you can use control runtime and cube builder to create a controller, a Kubernetes controller from scratch. And then you can subscribe to uh, the source controller events, get those manifests. Maybe in there, there are not Kubernetes YAMLs, maybe there are, I don't know, Terraform files or whatever else is there, and then you can do your own uh, your own thing. Okay, um, back to the uh, Flux users groups. Um, the second uh, use case that we target are, are cluster operators. So, what the cluster operator has to do is um, create cluster definitions being through cluster API, or maybe you have a NICS uh, cattle config file or something like that, that defines your, your clusters. Then you have to pick and choose cluster add-ons, configure those. Uh, then you have to onboard tenants like dev teams or other um, applications that are maybe not even managed by your own organization are managed by someone else. And once you have that all uh, defined uh, in a Git repository, then you can use that repo to uh, target uh, clusters and uh, define the desired state of your whole cluster fleet uh, through that repo. So in this approach, what I've described here is where you have a mono repo with everything inside and, um, and the clusters, uh, where Flux runs and it applies all the things in there. Now, of course, there are uh, many more approaches to this. Um, you can also have a monorepo only for your infrastructure items. And when it comes to the apps themselves, you can tell Flux to register those app repos inside the cluster. So in a way you can delegate responsibility for operations to other teams. Uh, while still running a single Flux instance on your cluster that connects to all these uh, external uh, sources that define the final cluster state. And here is where the, the challenge comes in when you, you as a cluster operator 
um, your team collaborates on this repo, right? So everything that changes there uh, is approved with pull requests uh, and so on. But if you don't have control over uh, the app deployments, maybe some other teams are in charge of it. Maybe you want to enforce some boundaries around what those repositories can contain and how they can affect your whole cluster state. And this is what I want to uh, show you today. First, we are going to um, provision a cluster. We are going to install some um, cluster add-ons. And then we are going to um, deploy applications from uh, other repositories that we have no control over. And, but we can, I'll show you how with Flux, you can restrict uh, whatever is in there and how you can also apply policies and other things for, uh, for what you don't actually manage. So how does a cluster admin uh, spins off Flux? So um, we have this procedure called bootstrap and uh, you can uh, bootstrap Flux on, on your clusters uh, with either the Flux CLI or with our um, uh, Terraform provider. What, what Bootstrap offers is a one-click provisioning for creating Git repositories, uh, setting up deploy keys, granting access to uh, teams for that particular repo, and of course, configuring and installing all the Flux components, uh, all the controllers from the GitHub store kit that you can pick and choose. For example, uh, maybe you don't want to uh, automate image updates, then you don't have to uh, install those controllers and so on. Or maybe you don't want to, uh, you, you don't use Helm, so you, don't, you, you can uh, install Flux without the, the Helm component and so on. Um, the, the bootstrap commands uh, works with uh, GitHub and GitLab APIs. So we actually call those APIs, we create the repos for you and so on. But we, uh, Flux Bootstrap also works with a local clone uh, and with your SSH agent. So it's not, you are not locked into only these two options, GitHub and GitLab. It works with any other Git provider that uh, supports SSH as long as you have an SSH agent. And let's say you don't have SSH enabled, you can also use uh, uh, Git over HTTPS as well with tokens and so on. So going to stop here with the presentation. I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to show you um, how Flux Bootstrap works. So I have a cluster here. Going to list all the namespaces. Okay, so I have a, an empty cluster. And now I want to um, create a repo on GitHub and I want to install Flux on, on, on my cluster and uh, drive all the other things, installing uh, cluster add-ons and so on only through uh, Git operations. So the, the first thing I will do, I'll run uh, the Flux bootstrap command. Uh, let me know if, if the text is visible for everybody. If you, if you right on the GitOps Days Slack channel, I can, I can see our messages. Okay, so the Flux uh, bootstrap command uh, takes the owner of, of GitHub, uh, what repository uh, I want to create. In my case is my uh, Kubernetes fleet. Um, you can also tell Flux if you want this repository to be created uh, private or public, if it's on your personal account, uh, which branch should be used for the cluster sync. And if you want to give Flux uh, right access to the, uh, to the repo or not. If you are using uh, the image automation components, you have to give Flux uh, uh, right access because it needs to you know, patch your YAMLs and write them back uh, uh, to Git. Hey, Stefan, can you hear us? Let me run this. Stefan, can you hear us? I think Stefan might have lost his audio. Hey, now hey. we see that um, the CLI has uh, created my repository. Now it, it does a, a local uh, clone. 
it generates all the flux manifests, all the components and so on. Then it pushes those manifests to Git. And uh, now it has generated the SSH uh, uh, private and public key, and it has used the, the public key to set up a deploy key on, on GitHub. So it, that's how uh, Flux uh, gains access to, to that repo. Um, of course, you could, uh, you could also run the bootstrap for, uh, uh, for HTTPS and, and tell Flux to use a um, um, personal access token. So you can create, let's say, a bot account for Flux in your GitHub organization and assign Flux that particular token. And uh, then you don't need to uh, set up deploy keys and so on. Um, there are different approaches. I, I feel like the deploy key is, the, is one of the most straightforward. So let's see what, uh, what happened on my cluster. If I'm looking at the namespaces, see that here is the Flux system namespace. If I'm going to look inside the namespace, uh, get towards Flux system, see that I have uh, four controllers running. Uh, this is the default Flux installation. Uh, the image automation uh, controllers are, uh, are still under development. Uh, they are in um, alpha, uh, stage, so um, they are, you have to tell Flux Bootstrap uh, to install them if you, if you want those. But we are getting very close on uh, releasing a stable version of the image automation. Uh, we have a proposal to um, promote our, our current V1 uh, Alpha 2 APIs to V1 uh, Beta 1. And once that's done, I expect it uh, by the end of this month. Then when you will be installing the next version of Flux, you, you'll get the image automation in there by default. So, okay, so I have Flux running on my cluster. Let's see what happened on, uh, on GitHub. So if I'm going to look at my repositories, I should see the repository that Flux created. So I'm going to make this bigger. Okay, so Flux created this repository for me and it has created also a, a, a directory structure here, clusters, staging, and in, in here we have the uh, all the YAMLs that are making up Flux. These are all the namespaces, custom resource definition, uh, deployments, and so on for all the GitOps Storekit controllers. And I also have here um, the main uh, sync manifest for for the for this whole repository and um, in order to um, clone this repository inside the cluster there is a git repository definition and to apply everything inside the uh, the, the staging uh, directory uh, there is a customization object so what this customization object does it it tells flux on my staging cluster hey apply whatever is in here so now if i'm if I add the YAML file, let's say a pod definition or whatever uh, uh, next to the Flux system directory, then uh, Flux will, will create it on the cluster. So anything outside the staging uh, path, uh, Flux will not look at it. It will only synchronize that. Why, uh, why Bootstrap creates this structure is for, for allowing you to uh, um, manage multiple clusters from a single repo. So you can uh, rerun Bootstrap, use a different cluster as the target, give it a different path, I don't know, uh, clusters, uh, production, and then you will be um, um, syncing with, production, with the production cluster as well from the same repo. But that's not a requirement. You can, you can create different repositories for your production environment, and you could use the same repository I don't know, for staging and development and so on. Uh, this is just one way to get started. There are uh, many other options. Uh, Flux is not opinated in that way. So you can, you can uh, do it whatever you want. Also, uh, the Flux bootstrap command is not uh, an absolute requirement to set up Flux. Uh, we provide uh, plain YAMLs and you can do this whole thing manual or uh, you can use the Terraform provider, which 
uh, can do uh, quite the same thing as 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 the bootstrap command. Okay, let's um, forward. I'm going. I'll try to use the GitHub code spaces. Let's hope that works. I'm going to. Okay. So this will launch uh, Visual Studio Code in my browser, and I can do all the operations uh, from my browser. Okay, have all, all the structure here. Let me make this bigger. So first thing, what I I'm going to do, I'm going to um, install the Flux CLI also here in uh, in the VM provisioned by GitHub. So now if I do Flux minus V, okay, I have the latest uh, Flux version installed. And as I've shown you, you have uh, the initial uh, manifests here. Now, let's say I want to install um, some infrastructure items on, on my cluster. And I'm go today I'm going to use Kiverno uh, to demo this. Uh, Kiverno is a, um, a policy uh, operator. Um, you can, for example, with Kiverno, you can uh, define something, something like uh, pod security policy, uh, since that is deprecated in, uh, in Kubernetes itself. And you can create all sorts of, of custom policies for your uh, teams, workloads, and so on. Like, this can be anything. It can be I don't know, a cert manager or whatever else. So um, I'm going to use the Flux CLI to generate YAMLs because I'm a very that typist, I, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. So I'm, uh, the CLI has uh, basically two functions. One is to generate YAMLs for you, uh, the Flux uh, custom resources, and the other one is for introspection, debugging, uh, and so on. So in here, in my uh, in Visual Studio Code, I'll only use Flux to generate YAMLs, while uh, on my machine, I'm going to use the Flux CLI to look at the cluster and, and see what's going on. Okay, so let's start first by creating the uh, Flux customization object um, in my uh, staging uh, directory. And what this does, it tells Flux, hey, apply uh, whatever is in this Top level directory called infrastructure. Um, so let me also create the infrastructure uh, directory. So I have this one here, and inside is uh, another directory called Kiverno. Now, how can I install something from, from a repo that I don't have control over? There are basically two options. I can go to, uh, to the Kiverno uh, repository. Uh, get there, um, install YAMLs from there, and co copy them in my uh, fleet repository. But if I'm doing that, then every time uh, there is a new release, I have to uh, keep tabs on it. I have to, you know, uh, copy paste everything back, and so on. Let's say I trust the Kiverno team uh, to test their releases, and I want to. And instead of doing all this uh, copy paste thing, I want to use their repository as the source of truth for when uh, deploying Kiverno. So how can I do that? First, I'm going to create a um, Git repository object that points to uh, the Kiverno um, um, GitHub repo. So if we look here, what uh, what the flux uh, command uh, generated is, uh, as I said, a Git repository custom resource that has here an URL, which is the Kiverno repo. And here is the interesting part. So instead of 
um, uh, reconciling the uh, the kernel manifest from a branch, I'm going to use uh, uh, git uh, git uh, tags in the sample format, and I here I define the uh, sample range, and what this does it tells Flux, hey, look at uh, all the git tags in the sample format, and if it matches uh, this expression, let's say uh, there is a new stable release, pull that release inside the cluster. Right, so let's um, commit these changes to my main uh, branch. Okay, I have committed my changes. Now, if I'm going to look at my cluster, flux get sources, for example, all, I want to see all sources. I see that I have only one source, which is uh, flux system, which points to, uh, to my repo. Now I can tell flux to, uh, to pull the latest commit that I did. And um, one command is flux reconcile source it flux system. And this is telling Flux, hey, pull the, pull the latest version. Now, you don't have to run this command unless you do demos like me. Flux will uh, uh, periodically uh, scan the repo for, uh, for new changes. And this uh, configuration is here when we set the interval and here is one minute. So if I would have waited one minute, Flux would have uh, pulled those changes on its own. Now, if I uh, run the get sources command again, I see that now I have a new uh, Git repository defined on my cluster and Flux has pulled the latest uh, stable release of Kiverno from, uh, from the repo. And here is the um, revision. The revision is composed out of the branch name or the tag name and the actual commit that's being pulled in the cluster. So now I have, the, uh, the source of my main repo, my uh, fleet repo, and I've also added some other external repo on my cluster. Now, if I'm going to look at the namespaces, there is no kernel namespace, right? Because I haven't told Flux what to do with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, source. How can I tell Flux to, uh, to act on it is through a customization object, a Flux customization object. And let's, uh, let's create it inside my uh, repo here. Okay, so I've created a new definition under Kiverno. So I have the source now Using the source, I'm uh, creating a customization object that takes this source, called Kiverno. And I'm, I'm telling Flux, hey, apply the manifests at this path definitions release. That's where the, um, the Kiverno manifests are. Um, reconcile this on the cluster every 10 minutes. So what this does, let's say, um, Flux applies the Kiverno manifests as they are in the source, in, in, the, in the Git repo. Then someone from your team with cluster admin roles goes in there, uh, does a kubectl edit of some uh, Kiverno uh, object, let's say the deployment or the service or the webhook or something like that. Flux every 10 minutes will check your cluster state and, and it will correct that uh, divergency. If you edit something, Flux will undo it. And there is also a catch to this. Um, <clears throat> Flux under, under the hood uses uh, kubectl and the three-way merge algorithm. So it will only override what things are defining Git. If uh, let's say you have a, a, an array list um, a list inside some definition and you add an item to that array, um, Flux will not override it. 
let's say you add a new environment variable. But if you change an environment variable that's already defining it, then Flux will, will override that, uh, that particular uh, setting. So, okay, we've, uh, we've generated this file. Oh, one more thing here, you see that there is a, a, a validation um, field inside the customization. What's, what this tells Flux is, hey, before you try to apply uh, uh, any manifest from this path, um, do a dry run apply first and check if there are any things that the uh, uh, Kubernetes API will, uh, will reject. Let's say maybe you have some custom resource in your, in your Git repo, but there is no custom resource definition on the cluster, right? Uh, uh, using turning on validation means that uh, the commits that are made in your in your um, in your sources in your Git repos are uh, atomically applied on the cluster, and and validation is is what makes this happen. If anything is wrong in your manifest, no matter how many there are, nothing will get applied. That particular commit contains something invalid, so uh, the cluster state will not move to, to that commit at all. If you disable validation then what Flux will do, it will no longer do the dry run. It will uh, try to apply. Some things will get applied, others wouldn't. So you'll get up in this uh, state where some parts of the, of the latest commit are, are in there, are in the cluster and some aren't. So um, there are two options here for validation. One is client-side validation, and one uh, the other one is server-side validation. So you can uh, uh, set here server. And when, when you use the server-side validation, you also trigger all the webhooks uh, that you have installed uh, inside the cluster. So for example, let's say you use a Kiverno policy to block pods that are running, with in, uh, are running uh, as root or they are running with uh, inside the, the host network. Um, you will not get a rejection when you do a client-side dry run, but if you do a server-side run, all the webhooks will be triggered and you'll get that message, hey, you are not allowed to do that. Otherwise, it will just fail when, when Flux tries to apply. Okay, so I'm going to push this change and see what, what happens. going to tell Flux to synchronize again. So there are, there are two ways on, on, on uh, triggering uh, um, um, a reconciliation menu. You either can tell Flux, hey, pull the latest version from, uh, from Git. And what happens is that source controller pulls the, the latest commit. And if there is something new to, uh, uh, to what's already in the cluster, it notifies all the other controllers. Or with the CLI, you can do flux reconcile a particular uh, customization. And here you can say with source. And what will this do is first, it pulls the source, it tells source control, hey, fetch whatever is new there, then immediately tells the, uh, the specialized reconciler, in this case, the customized controller, apply it uh, right now. Um, so let's say this will, the apply will happen a couple of seconds faster if you, uh, if you use this command than the other one. But in the end, everything is even driven inside uh, the GitOps toolkit. So any kind of change will, will notify the right reconcilers to, uh, to act upon it. So we have um, the new revision. Now, if we are going to look at all the customizations that I have in my clusters, in my cluster, I see now that I have this Kiverno uh, customization that has applied this revision. So I should, uh, I should see Kiverno namespace. It's there. Um, if I do get pods. see that the Kiverno webhook is up and running. So this is how I can 
uh, install infrastructure items. What's, what's important note here is that when Flux reconciles uh, this customization, it will do it under the cluster admin role. Uh, why, why do we need cluster admin? Let's look at, at Kiverno. So if we go to definitions release, we have here install YAML, and we can see that it has namespace, custom resource definitions, uh, webhooks, and so on. So for example, to install a, a custom resource definition, you have to have a cluster admin, uh, a restricted account that can only target the namespace, cannot create such a, a global resource. So right now, by default, Flux reconciles uh, things under cluster admin, but I'll, I'll show you how we can change that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the changes in the future to this, uh, to this behavior. Okay, so now I have my um, my infrastructure set up. Let's say I want to uh, install an uh, application that belongs to a particular team. Let's say we have a dev team that's in charge of uh, developing apps and the Kubernetes manifests for inst installing that particular app is in their own repo. So it's not a repo that I own, but is also not a, a repository from outside, like even it's in, it's in my organization. But still, I want to enforce some boundaries around what the dev team can, can do to, the, uh, to my cluster. And let's say my app that I want to uh, deploy does not need to um, uh, create any kind of um, cluster-wide resources. My app is made out of deployment services and so on, which can be um, restricted to a single namespace or multiple namespaces. And I'm going to use a um, um, demo app that I wrote and maintained for a long time, spot info. Um, and I have here, so, so let's assume this, this application is developed uh, by some team, and I want to um, take from this repository uh, a directory that contains the, uh, the deploy manifest, and I want to install it on my cluster. And um, Podinfo has a bunch of, of options of how you can deploy it. Uh, for example, here is a customized overlay that uh, contains a deployment spec, it's a simple deployment uh, manifest, an horizontal pod autoscaler, and a service. So I want to configure Flux in such a way that it will um, watch this directory inside this repository and it will uh, reconcile everything from here on my cluster. But I don't want to do it on my default namespace. Like there is no namespace specified here. so it will go to default. Maybe I want, don't want to do that. I want, don't want to install apps in the default namespace because that's, I guess, you know, quite bad. Don't use the default namespace. Uh, create namespaces for, uh, for, for workloads. So one option is I'm going to talk to the dev team and ask them, hey, can you put here um, a namespace, let's say apps, right? And they can do that change for you and then you will be uh, configuring uh, that particular uh, synchronization. But let's assume we, we don't want to change anything in our, uh, in our app repo. We want to make this change uh, in our uh, fleet infrastructure. Me as a platform admin, I decide where the apps go in which namespace. So how can I do that? First, so I'm going to go back to my fleet repo here. And first thing that I will do is I'm going to create a new top level uh, Flux customization for, um, for my apps. So I'm saying, hey, apply whatever is in the apps directory. 
Now let's create that directory. I'm going to create uh, apps for info where I'm going to configure how that particular application is going to, uh, um, to be installed and reconciled on, on my cluster. But I don't want to use cluster admin when I'm uh, uh, when I'm applying manifest from from this particular repo. Uh, so Flux allows you to map um, Teams repositories to an identity inside Kubernetes, and there are two ways of uh, defining identities in Kubernetes. One each is through a service account, and another one is through a Kubernetes user. I'm going to, uh, to use the service account. So I'm going to, to run this command. Flux create tenant. I'm going to name my tenant uh, dev team. And I'm going, I'm saying, hey, the dev team uh, owns the namespace apps and export this uh, as a definition. And let's let's say what let's see what the create tenant command did. So if we go here in the apps directory, we see that there is a new YAML called dev team and the flux create tenant command created uh, all these Kubernetes objects for me. It has created the namespace, has added a label. So uh, with the tenant, so we can easily uh, query with kubectl uh, which uh, namespaces belong to which tenant. And it has also created a service account for me um, in the apps namespace called DevT. And a role binding that grants the service account access to the apps namespace, nothing else, only to this namespace. Now, if a tenant, your team, um, let's say deploys apps, not in a single namespace, but multiple namespaces, the create tenant command accepts multiple namespaces and it will create all this boilerplate for it. Of course, you can go in here and fine tune the role binding. You can do uh, whatever you want here. This is pure Kubernetes RBAC. Uh, the, the Flux CLI just gives you a quick way of, of provisioning uh, tenants, but this is not something specific to Flux. This is pure uh, Kubernetes uh, role-based access. Okay, so I have created the namespace and the service account. Great, now going to uh, register the pod info uh, Git repository in my cluster. Let's do this. Okay, so inside the pod info directory, now I have a Git repo story that points to my uh, repo. And let's say we want to synchronize not with uh, Samverse this time, I want to synchronize with a branch, with the master branch. And I want to undo, uh, I want to pull from this branch every 30 seconds. Of course, you can uh, set up here whatever interval you want and so on. Okay, let's first. Um, Push this. Great. Now, tell Flux to synchronize everything. Okay, now let's look at uh, namespaces. Look at namespaces, see that, okay, uh, the apps namespace has been created. And if you look inside of it, you'll see the service account, the role binding and so on. Now let's look at sources. Now, if you do flags get sources all, we'll still see only two sources because unlike kubectl that uh, defaults to the default namespace, the Flux CLI defaults to the Flux system namespace. But in here, in my definition, I haven't created the source in my, uh, in, in the namespace ma uh, meant for uh, platform means I've created this source in the apps namespace. So if we want to list 
all the sources from everywhere inside my cluster. I can do get sources all, all namespaces. And now I see, okay, uh, have this source registered and it has pulled this particular commit. Of course, there is still nothing in the uh, apps namespace because I've just registered the source, right? Now, I want to apply all these things and modify the namespace. I, want, I don't want to um, deploy pod info in the, in the default namespace. I want to deploy it in the apps one. So how can I do that? I have a create customization command that uh, tells Flux how to um, uh, reconcile pod info. Let's run this one. And let's look what it has generated. So I'm using this time the Git repository uh, source. I have here defined health checks. So um, Flux after it applies everything, it will uh, it will also wait for the deployment rollout. Rollout if if there is an error, if that deployment doesn't roll out, Flux can uh, will trigger a Kubernetes event. And you can also configure uh, external notifications to Slack, Discord, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you could also write back to Git as a, a Git commit status. And all of that is made through uh, a, a Flux notification controller. We'll, we'll probably talk about that later on. But the idea is uh, you, can, you can tell Flux to, uh, to look after uh, the workloads that are supposed to run and uh, Flux will, will be aware if, if everything goes wrong. And we support here any kind, uh, any Kubernetes kind that's compatible with uh, a library called kstatus. And so you can use all the native uh, Kubernetes resources and config map secrets, custom resource definitions and so on, but also other custom resources like the Flux custom resources or the Tecton ones or Knative and so on that subscribe to the uh, K status um, uh, conditions. So you can, if your custom resource exposes a ready condition, then K status will, will look at that. And there are other conditions uh, that you can use to better integrate with, with K status. So the idea here is that. Uh, the more custom resources will adopt um, the upstream way of, of, of verifying if something has been uh, uh, reconciled on the cluster, uh, the better the Flux integration will be because it will know how to, to verify all of those. Okay, so this is about health check. Um, I've told you about the source. Now, there is also a property called target namespace here. And what I'm telling Flux is that no matter the namespace that is set in this path, maybe the customized overlay sets its own namespace, or like in my example with pod info, there is no namespace at all. So it will go to default. Target namespace will uh, basically create a patch will, uh, and will set that namespace for the, all the, um, the manifests that are, are, are reconciled from here. And of course, I enable validation and I've also set up a timeout for my health check because, yeah, uh, this can, uh, can take a long time and you should be setting uh, timeouts for, for this. Okay, let's uh, apply this one and see what happens. Okay. If we... Tell Flux to reconcile again so you don't have to wait. Okay, let's look at um, the Flux customizations in the apps namespace. Okay, we see that it has applied the latest uh, version. Now, if we look at the pods in there, we should see um, 
two uh, pods because replica is set to four for for pod info. Now, what happens if I'm I'm going to the let's say I'm the uh, one of the dev teams, uh, one of the uh, devs of pod info, and I'm I'm going in in that repo because I have access to it. I can push anything I want there, and I I'm, I'm going to go there and create some. Uh, cluster all binding, or I'm going to add namespaces there, then delete them and so on. Um, what will actually happen is nothing. The, the um, pod info customization will fail and will, will say, I don't have enough permissions uh, to change anything outside the app's namespace. How, how, do we, how have we enforced that is through uh, this field here, called service account name, like for uh, deployments or pods or anything like that. You can specify uh, a service account name for a particular uh, Flux customization. And this one is mapped to the dev team. If we look at um, here at the dev team definition, we see that, okay, there is a service account of dev team inside the app's namespace. That's why the, the reconciliation worked. Um, So what, what Flux is doing when, when you specify a service account name, Flux, instead of using the cluster admin to, uh, to apply the manifest, it will use a Kubernetes impersonation. It will um, find this particular service account. If it exists, it will use this service account identity when it does uh, uh, the apply, uh, the delete, the health check, every single operation in, uh, in this customization will run under uh, this service account name. And this is how you basically can define tenants and, and give them ide uh, uh, identities inside the class that match some particular uh, source, some particular Git repository. Now, um, there is a proposal in, in, in the Flux organization to uh, also add um, a different option where Flux, instead of impersonating just service accounts, Flux will also be able to impersonate Kubernetes users. And in a way, impersonating users makes way more sense when you talk about tenants and repositories, right? You want to, uh, service account is something made for machines, but in this case, you may want to uh, tell Flux to run a reconciliation, uh, to run the, uh, the synchronization for a particular user as that particular user. So in the future, there will be, there is, uh, we are working on this as we speak. Uh, there is a pull request in, uh, in customized controller where you can, um, there is a new field called principal and you can say uh, impersonate a particular user. And, um, what we are um, thinking is when you provision a namespace, uh, we'll create that user uh, automatically in that namespace and Flux by default, when it reconciles a customization in a namespace that let's say is not Flux system, it's any other namespace, it will look for that user, even if you don't specify it. So in a way it will enforce uh, uh, this, um, um, role-based access on, on everything it does. And that's, that's something will, it will happen pretty soon. We are, we've been debating this, uh, this new approach to multi-tenancy for months now. We, we came to a, uh, to a conclusion that, you know, offering this, uh, uh, this, um, this other way of impersonating users is a better mechanism than just service accounts. You could, you will still be able to use service accounts um, if you if you want that, but uh, you'll you'll have yet another option. Okay, so I have set this up now. I can change the target namespace, but what about other things? What if I want to change some other uh, property of of pod info? How can I do that? Um, the Flux customization supports inline patches. And 
like a, a, a customized config that you place on your uh, on your file system and you run uh, let's say customized build for it you can specify uh, 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 strategic merge patches or JSON patches and so on. Flux uh, builds uh, on top of that feature and allows you to do things like this. So here we can uh, add a, a strategic merge patch for the, um, going to delete the namespace is not needed. Uh, for the pod for deployment. And let's say I want to set up security context uh, for my application. My dev team is not aware of this. They don't know which user they should be choosing, which uh, file system group and so on. Uh, maybe I have a Kiverno policy that actually blocks pod info from, uh, uh, from being uh, deployed on the cluster. Maybe you want to enforce things like like uh, run as users and run as group. So instead of you know, going into the app repo, changing all these things there, you can basically create here an overlay and you know, mess up with the, with the initial manifest. Is this the best approach? I think for small changes, uh, it can be uh, super useful. Let's say you want to add security context everywhere to every single uh, workload for a particular customization. Uh, that's simple enough to, uh, to create an inline patch. But if you are changing a dozen things, uh, then you should be using a customized config and place that customization.yaml uh, uh, file inside your, uh, inside your um, repo and you know, import patches from uh, from the file system and so on. Um, this is a future that's more about, I want to do this change. I want to enforce this change anywhere. I don't want to create any customized overlay in my in my fleet repo. So you can, you can do this kind of, um, you know, inline patches. So let's see if this works. Going to push this change. I'm going to turn flux to sync again. Okay, let's look now at the pods, see what's happening. Okay, so what we see now is that, okay, there is no change in, in the original repo where all these manifests are coming from. There is no change in, in, in pod info. But because I've, uh, I've added an inline patch, uh, it tells Flux, hey, the source didn't change, but how you should reconcile it, the policy of reconciling it, that changed. So uh, redo the, uh, the apply. And this is what's happening here. The pods are uh, recreated and if we, do look at the pods. See, we we'll look at this one. We should see here the security in context that I just patched. So this uh, these properties are not in pod info in any way, right? This has no security context uh, on the pod, right? So with, with, with this approach, I can onboard applications. Then I can restrict what uh, an app repo can contain with Kubernetes RBAC. I can then assign a service account and in the future a Kubernetes user uh, to the uh, reconciler. And I can also make patches uh, to, um, to the upstream uh, manifests. Are there any questions so far? Let me check Slack because I probably can't hear anything.
Let me check questions. Okay, one question is, what approach is our people using when your organization needs a higher SLA on the Git repo provider than it gives? Okay. Yeah, there's, that's, a, that's a good question. Like when you define your cluster state in, in some Git uh, provider, let's say GitHub, Azure DevOps, whatever, uh, then any downtime of, of that particular service uh, could have major implications on your uh, deployment uh, pipelines. Now, what we are what we are doing with uh, with source controller is the fact that we connect to the source, we take the latest commit or whatever you specify there, your git tags and so on, and we. We create a cache inside your cluster called an artifact where we uh, we store uh, everything from your Git repo. So, let's say the GitHub goes down, or there is a network connection between your cluster and GitHub. GitHub goes down. That doesn't mean that let's say manual changes are not being rolled back on your cluster. It doesn't mean that uh, customization and reconciliation doesn't happen. You'll see that. You'll see an event from source controller. Hey, I can no longer clone the repo. Here is the error. I don't know, TCP timeout or whatever it is. But all the other things will, will keep running. Uh, the customizations will keep uh, uh, reconciling and so on with the known last state. Now, when let's say GitHub goes back online, source controller will recover, pull if is there something new, and that will be applied. So. What we are trying to do with, with source control and this approach where we decoupled the reconciliation side from dealing with sources is we are, we are trying to uh, make Flux more resilient to uh, outside um, issues like, okay, my Git goes down. Uh, now, another alternative to, to Git, uh, and that's new, that's only in the latest Flux version is the ability to uh, synchronize with, let's say, buckets um, um, being a streaming or, or whatever. Uh, why we've implemented that is because usually uh, buckets are stored uh, in the same uh, region, in the same uh, zone with your clusters. So they are closer to your cluster. That means less latency and they are uh, um, distributed uh, globally. So those type of services are likely to stay, to have a better uptime than, uh, than, than Git repos. Now, if you use uh, buckets, you, you lose some things from the whole uh, uh, GitOps thing. For example, you can no longer verify authenticity using COVID signs. You can uh, no longer say, I want to go back to this particular commit. Right, it's whatever is in that bucket is is applied. We uh, we create a checksum for everything that we we find in the bucket, and that's the let's say the uh, the ID of the uh, artifact that's being pulled. But yeah, these are these are currently uh, the two options that we have. Okay, let me go forward okay another question is differences between image repository and image automation okay so going back a little here have a have a slide to explain that so how, how image automation works? We have, as I said, two controllers. One is called the image reflector and the one is called the image automation. Um, image reflector connects to uh, uh, image uh, uh, repositories. So you create an image repository object 
where you say, hey, this is my uh, image URL. Here is the uh, Docker pull secret for it. Connect the registry and pull all the, uh, all the uh, container image tags that are available uh, on that uh, repository. Then you have a, a different uh, custom resource called image policy, where you tell Flux, hey, from all these tags that you, find, that you found on the image repository, uh, you tell Flux which one you want to, uh, uh, to look for. And there are a couple of uh, options here. For example, you can use a uh, sample range. Let's say you tag your uh, your image tags, um, uh, you tag your images using sample. So you can create an image policy and tell Flux, hey, if a new tag is uh, is pushed, a new uh, container is pushed to the registry, check if the tag matches this sample range, and uh, if it's a newer image from what we are running on the cluster, uh, then notify the image automation controller. The image automation controller has a, a, its own configuration called uh, image update automation, where you tell uh, Flux how to apply changes back to Git. So the image uh, update automation points to a Git repository and to image policies. So what the image automation controller does if, if there is a new image tag that matches a, a policy, it will clone the repo, uh, goes to, uh, scans all the manifests in your repo, finds where it needs to uh, bump the image tag. It writes that to the manifest and then it commits and pushes, pushes those, um, those changes back to the repo. Now you can, there are two ways of doing this. You can have this fully automated where the image automation controller will push changes to the same branch or the, the, to the same branch that's being used by Flux to reconcile the cluster. So it will be automatically to change the image tag. Um, source controller detects, oh, there is a new manifest, pulls the manifest, then customize controller applies the manifest. And this is how you roll out a new uh, image controller version. And the other option is you can tell the image automation controller to push these changes to a different branch than the one that you use for uh, synchronizing. Now you can, that branch doesn't have to exist. Image automation controller can also create branches for you. And using something like GitHub Actions or, or GitLab CI or something like that, you can uh, open pull requests from that particular branch where, where Flux has pushed the change, a pull request for, uh, for the uh, branch that's being synced. And this is how you can manually approve all these, all these changes. You'll be reviewing the, the pull request to see, okay, Flux wants to bump all these versions. You merge it and only then uh, that particular change will get applied. Okay. Uh, also on this topic, are there some nice ways to integrate the image update automation into CI? Thinking of something like Dependabot. Right, so of course you can definitely use Dependabot or any other bot that you are writing to patch um, manifests in Git, you don't have to necessarily use what we have we have built here with uh, with flux um, I don't know if Pendabot knows about um, image registries voice stories policies and so on but I'm guessing you could definitely write some back script that does it uh, we are we are offering this as a, a optional feature to flux uh, but it's Definitely, you can do it. You can do the band manually. You can do it with other systems that have right access to your Git repo. Can those changes happen in files that won't end up in the cluster? Right. So, because all these controllers are they work independently from one one to another, you could let's say have some ephemeral cluster, some kind cluster, for example, 
where you um, define image update automation, image policies, and image uh, repositories, and so on. It doesn't have to run on the same cluster where you do the reconciliation. So you can have this uh, uh, the automation part running on a dedicated cluster, or I don't know, kind cluster in GitHub uh, CI or whatever, and uh, these controllers will, you know, will write back to a repo. And from there, it gets synchronized. So you don't have to run them all in the same cluster. Or another approach is you can have a dedicated cluster for, uh, for image automation that patches uh, manifests in different repositories. Maybe you have a, repo a dedicated repository for staging and a dedicated repository for production. You can have this kind of automation running anywhere where is a... Uh, uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so there is also a question around um, image automation and uh, namespaces. Uh, we require right now for all these objects, all these four objects here, the, uh, the repository, the policy, the Git repository, and the image uh, update automation to be stored in a single namespace. There is no cross namespace reference between these objects. So if you want to update uh, something in the apps namespace, you have to create this, uh, uh, these custom resources there, right? And it also needs the image pool secret. So you have to bundle all of those in each namespace where you do the automation. Um, there are, there have been many discussions in Flux how we can make this uh, work better where you, uh, you eliminate a lot of duplication. Maybe I don't want to create all these things in each namespace, I want to use it in a single namespace and so on, but then you have to copy all the image pool secrets and so on. Now with the, with the new, a multi tenancy proposal. Uh, if you look in there at the comments, I, I, I made a proposal where uh, a Git repository or any kind of source, a bucket or whatever, can have an access list uh, defined in there. And then the image update automation could refer a Git repository in a different namespace. And the controller will check am I allowed to use this repo? and um, the access list on the repository itself will, uh, will enforce this kind of cross namespace access without breaking multi-tenancy, right? Because if we just allow uh, an image auto automation to reach out to any Git repository in any namespace, then you could see how a tenant could gain right access to another tenant's uh, source. So, that's why right now we everything is uh, is limited to a single namespace, but we are working towards a solution where we allow cross namespace reference, but in a safe way where the owner of the source, the owner of the Git repository, uh, explicitly allows which namespace, which tenant can use uh, the source that uh, he or she uh, uh, created in a particular namespace. Okay, let me check for other questions. Hey, Stefan. It's Scott. Um, I wanted to okay. help. doesn't look like it. Oops. No. Going to show you one more thing. How garbage collection works. Hey, hey, Scott. Hey, can you hear me? Can Going hear to me? stop sharing a little so I can uh, fix my audio. One second.
How about now? Is it okay? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, great. All right. I just wanted to note that there were a few other questions in Slack you might not have seen, and just help a little bit with that. Um, we can also I can also uh, repost them in Slack if that's easier for you than stopping the screen share and and talking here. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I, I can look them up now without sharing uh, my screen. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I can pop off my video then. I just wanted to to help you or pass you some questions if, if that would be helpful. Thanks. It's really interesting so far, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so one question. Are there Terraform or cross-plane controller plugins to infra provisioning? I know that Crossplane has a, a custom resource definition controller, their own CRD controller. Um, so yeah, you could place those. Um, maybe I'm mistaken, but if I remember correctly, Crossplane offers such a thing. Uh, so you can place the Crossplane custom resource for a particular infrastructure item inside your uh, uh, inside the repo where. Um, that flux syncs. So it will apply it, the cross plane controller will react to it and uh, it will uh, create that particular infrastructure. And then you can use flux depends on uh, relationship to say, hey, I want first all these infra items uh, to be created first. Um, maybe add a health check to it. So you can actually, flux can actually see, okay, everything in there all that infrastructure is up and running, then Flux will move to Kubernetes things like deployments, ingress controllers, and so on. Um, that's one uh, one thing I I uh, I, did, I didn't mention in, in the in the demo. But uh, when I when I've created the uh, apps customization, I I've told it, hey, this app customization depends on the infrastructure customization. And what that happens is, let's say we you delete the cluster that uh, you have reconciled or uh, something really uh, wrong went uh, there, you recreate the cluster using the, the same repo, then Flux will install all things in the order that you have described using the, uh, the depends on relationship. So you can say things like, I want uh, my policy webhook to be installed first, verify that the webhook pod is running and only then apply other things. So all these other things are subject to the policy and the policy has been applied first. And this also works uh, not only at install time, but also uh, later on during the life cycle of your, uh, of your app. Let's say you have uh, an app and a database. Uh, you want to update the database first and then the app. Uh, if you uh, push a commit that changes both things, and you have a depends on relationship between the application and the database, what Flux will do will first apply the changes to the uh, database customization, let's say, or maybe you have a Helm release or, or other things. Uh, it waits for, uh, for that particular workload to be rolled out, uh, to be healthy, and only then proceeds to the next step, let's deploy the app or run the, app, the migration and, and so on. So you can imagine how you can define like a dependency tree between infrastructure and apps and maybe only between apps themselves. Um, we, we support this kind of um, dependency uh, uh, structure uh, between hand releases as well. So let's say you, you work with hand releases and you have a, a bunch of those, you can, can specify in which order they should be installed. And yeah, that's, uh, that's about, that's all about depends on. Um, can maybe share my screen back to show you. So inside the repo here, if we look at, at the apps customization, we see that here we have a depends on relationship and tells it, hey, I'm depending on the infrastructure and the infrastructure is here, right? So it will first apply this one. I can also add health checks here. 
let's say I want to verify the Kvernal pod is running and only then uh, the apps will be reconciled. And every time you do a, you make any change to your field repo, the depends on is calculated and all the things are uh, applied in that particular order. So in, it's not only about install time, it's only, it's every time you, you push a change, all these changes will be executed like this. Now, if a, uh, uh, if a dependent, uh, if a dependency uh, doesn't work, maybe the the deployment fails. Nothing else will will be applied, and all its uh, dependence will uh, will pause. Will wait for uh, uh, for that particular workload to either be healthy, or maybe you do a, a new commit, you fix that thing, and then it will it will resume uh, to resume working. Let me check other questions. Hey there, I have a few other questions that I saw. I'm not sure. I may have I, had, I may have missed them, Stefan. But um, uh, do you want me to do you want me to read a few of these out? Yes, think... please. Okay, great. Um, well, one is. Um, uh someone asked now i know this this may not relate to what you were just talking about but it is related to your talk the person uh dimitri was asking uh yesterday i was interested how can i use tenant abstraction what is it for and may I ask about a clear description oh sorry a asked about a clear description and still can't get a clear understanding of it i thought um that might be you might want to address that. Um, if it's too far off from what you're talking about, we can always do that set one separately. Yeah, I mean, the idea of a tenant in, in Flux is just a way of defining some identity inside the cluster that matches something from outside. As I said, in our current implementation, a tenant is reflected by namespaces, service account in each namespace and a role binding for that particular service account, right? So in the create tenant uh, uh, command, just, you know, generates all, all these things for you. And the, the idea here is that you want to restrict access of what things can happen in a repo and what are, uh, those changes, how are those changes reflected inside the cluster? Like if you if you don't set up any kind of uh, service accounts or role binding or anything like that, what what the tenant could do, let's say they add a namespace definition that matches some other namespace, which is not theirs, and then they are they will delete the namespace from their repo. What will happen? Flux will actually delete that namespace from the cluster. And then it will recreate the namespace because, well, it's defined in another repo and so on. So to avoid all these conflicts and to you know, put a boundary on what a repo can contain and uh, restrict what kind of operations are translated from uh, manifest to, to actual things inside the cluster, uh, this is the Kubernetes way of doing it, right? You, you create... Uh, role-based access and you, you you define bindings for it and you bind it to a service account and in the future to a, to a user. Cool, that probably, hopefully that helped. Hopefully that helps, Dimitri. Maybe that question was before I did a demo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, but it, but at least it's good to to be uh, to give a little extra clarity. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, I know you mentioned something about this, but I don't know if it was fully, fully discussed. Um, Peter Z asked, are there Terraformer cross-plane controllers slash plugins to GitOpsify infra provisioning? Yeah, I, I answered that. So as long as there is some controller out there that has a custom resource that defines how the Terraform stuff should be um, applied or how the cross-plane definition should be made into reality, then yes, you can use it to Flux. 
we ourselves are not, we don't have our own Terraform control, we don't have our own cross-plane control and so on. Um, those are, don't think those are um, in scope for Flux right now. What we want to do, what is our, let's say, roadmap, uh, by the end of the year, we want to release a, a version 2 GA. We want to, uh, before that, we want to have all our APIs stable, um, deal with any bug that there is there. So in terms of new features, you will not see so many new features in, in, the, in the coming months. We are focusing on um, you know, making version two as stable as possible before uh, before the GA release. There are many discussions in the uh, in, in the, on Flux GitHub. Uh, so we we use GitHub discussions to uh, debate futures and so on. There are a couple of good proposals like okay, people want to have some controller that uh, listens to pull requests. Uh, once a pull request is made, Flux should pull all the changes from that pull request. Uh, maybe create a cluster using cluster API um, and run all, all those changes there and write back to the uh, to the pull request API, whatever is there, GitHub, GitLab, whatever. The result of, hey, you've changed that, I've created a cluster, I've run uh, your changes and it broke, so, or it works and so on, right? That's, that's one thing that could be in scope or flux. Uh, we are not working on it at the moment. Other things are stuff like uh, manual gating where you don't want to use pull requests for some reason. You let everybody uh, push things directly to your main branch. And on the flux side, on the cluster side, you want to a flux to notify, hey, there is a new change. Should I apply it? And you, you or someone else manually, you tell flux, yes, apply it. Right, so that's a manual gate proposal there with a, a, a specialized controller that, that deals with this and so on. Um, other, also around the manual gating, like people say, hey, I want to disable all my continuous deployment pipelines during weekends, right? Or no deploy Friday, no, all that nonsense. Um, yeah. So the manual gating could have like a time span where you can say, okay, for this particular period of time, we, uh, we completely freeze uh, the reconciliation of the cluster to the last known state and we don't take uh, any more changes. Once the, uh, the window has expired, only then we, we resume operations and so on. And yeah, these are all nice proposals that we are looking into, but there will not be working on any of those uh, in the nearest future. I think we have two more questions uh, before we transition into the uh, the DJ desired state and the 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 uh, the panel. The excuse me, not panel, but the the uh, discussion. Um, one is one is. Uh, any plans for implementing dips for Helm releases? This is by Eugene um, Polyinch. Yeah, this is uh, another interesting topic in uh, in Flux around diffs. Uh, so what there is currently a pull request in in customized controller that implements uh, diffs for uh, using kubectl diff, uh, and this uh, is more about making the notifications better. Like we eliminate, we try to eliminate things that Flux itself, uh, the changes that Flux, Flux made makes to the uh, manifest and only send the notification, hey, this is what changed by eliminating those. Because for example, Flux garbage collection, how it works, it labels all objects. So um, the Kubernetes API will say, Everything changed because the checksum label has, has changed, but that doesn't mean you've changed, you actually made that change in your repo. You change only one file, but the whole thing uh, has a different, like the whole thing has a different checksum, right? So we, we are, uh, um, someone has, is contributing this to the customized controller and will probably have it in, in Helm controller at some point as well. Uh, but it's more about, uh, notifications than blocking the reconciliation. What, what I understand from, from the diff request is 
that you want to be presented with a diff, a uh, uh, flag should not actually apply any change. You should approve that diff and only then flux will apply. For that, we need a, a UI and there is a lot of work around the flux UI. Uh, right now, the flux UI is all about uh, observability and showing you what things are reconciled in the cluster. But maybe at some point, uh, the flux UI will be that tool that can show you the diff and give you some kind of mechanism where you can approve or, uh, or block a, a particular change. Uh, yet again, this is not something that will happen uh, this year, if you ask me. OK, and the last question is, uh, it's by, by Daniel. Can we see your dog, Stefan? <laughs> my, my what? Your dog, you're such a cute dog. Or or am I going to disappoint the audience if your dog's not around? It's not around. She's... Uh... <laughs> All right, we'll have to send out... Plane. We'll send out pictures to the to Slack. How about that? Okay, okay. I'll right. do, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I pasted the link that you were just describing to that PR into Slack as well for anyone interested. And we can follow up on the Helm Diff uh, topic in Slack as well. Um, Stefan, thank you so much. This was so... Uh, interesting, um, and there were there were many pe many people commenting, and um, thanks a lot. This was great. Thank you very much for uh, for being with me here. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.